its first time into the inner solar system. Um, so we don't really know too much about these things because there's just no data on them. This is about the best we can do with that. And that was by sheer luck that it passed by Mars. And there are lots of spacecraft that orbit around Mars. And so it gave an opportunity to take those cameras and telescopes pointing down on Mars to point up at this comet. And so you can see this is about 500 meters, so this comet's about 500 meters in size. And if it had hit Mars, uh, well, no one's living on Mars, so probably no one would really care too much, but it could have been interesting. But actually, I just missed Mars, so. Anyway, so. so, but suppose it were to actually impact Mars, or suppose it were to impact Earth. And we don't want a comet to impact Earth because we're on Earth, right? So, how would we make sure that it doesn't hit the Earth? So, uh, as an example of how to get rid of a comet, consider comet C 2012S1 Ison. This is a comet from that passed really close to the sun in 2013. And it passed by the sun just 14 months after discovery. So these things are fast. You find them, and within a couple of years, they'll uh, either pass by the sun safely and harmlessly, or they'll hit the Earth. So if you want to come up with a technique to make sure they don't hit the Earth, you have to do it fast. So, uh, all right, so here's a composite image of the, uh, of the comet passing by the sun. Uh, that's the sun represented by the white circle in the middle. This is a coronagraph on board the uh, Solar and Heliosphere Observatory SOHO. And this is just blocking up the sun right here. That's the size of the sun. Comets, uh, see in the lower right, it's the comets moving in. But what you see coming out of the top is actually just a pile of dust coming out. So this, the sun is effectively mitigating any threat of this comet ever impacting anything by just basically just vaporizing it. So let's consider it more humane rather than just kill all the comets, right? Because, uh, I mean, comets never did anything wrong that to us, right? I mean, they're harmless until they actually hit the Earth. So, just consider that, consider an easier way. I mean, just keep it in space. We don't have to destroy it completely. And so, we might consider moving one of these comets by observing these jets right here. These jets form when uh, the sun heats up the ice that's on the comet and pushes material out in the top, in this case. These jets act as uh, essentially rocket thrusters and actually are pushing the comet down, in this case. And so this image was from Rosetta. So consider deflection of comets by the sun. So we have a century of a, centuries of astrometry data of comets, where they are in the sky, how they move, and so ever since the days of Edmund Halley, and even in fact earlier, uh, we've been recording where these comets are. And so we actually know how these comets behave under the uh, influence of solar heating. And so what this equation represents is the acceleration of the comet by non-gravitational forces. So you know gravity causes the comet to follow its general orbit, but with the jets from the sun, it actually doesn't follow perfectly a parabolic or elliptical orbit that the comet would otherwise follow. So we know how these comets behave. So with long period comets, the ones that, for example, come into the inner solar system once and then leave never to return again, if one of, for, for those, those are much harder to tell because, I mean, we've never observed them before and up until, say, a year before they pass by the Earth. So those are hard to predict. And, but we can basically still guess at, we can assume this behavior still and of, uh, 
these long period comets since, uh, I mean, there's, they still follow the same physics. It's just that we don't know the exact composition or their shape has not been observed. We don't know their rotation. So they're, they're harder to predict, but we can still estimate the general uh, trends they follow. And so that leads to uh, David Levy's quotes, quote on comets in that they're like cats because they both have tails and they do precisely what they want. So, all right, so we want controlled comet deflection. We don't want to just let the sun deflect the comet for us. It, it would be nice except, uh, well, the sun, it, it deflects as many comets into the earth as it deflects away, right? So we need a comet that you can actually, we, we need a, essentially a sun that you can control, you can turn on and turn off, right? Because if the sun with its uh, forces actually push the comet into the earth, well, we want to turn the sun off so that the comet no longer crashes the earth, right? So we want to go with sun too, basically. But that's a little hard. I mean, you need like 10 to 30 kilograms of hydrogen and hydrogen is, uh, well, it's, not too expensive, but 10 to 30 kilograms of it, that's still kind of expensive. So uh, we can't really build a sun or a second sun. But what we can do is build a laser, like you see in the background. And with a laser, you're not wasting all the light. You're, fo you're only focusing all of your light. Uh, I guess it's blocking the picture in the background, but the laser focuses all the light onto your target that you want. With the sun, it wastes a whole lot of energy by just uh, shining into deep space. So, with the, so in that way, we uh, don't actually need the full 10 to 30 kilograms hydrogen. We can build lasers on Earth. So what we propose is to use a essentially a phased array of lasers in Earth orbit, and or uh, one on the ground. So what a phased array essentially is, is a large number of lasers um, pointed at the same object, in this case the comet, and they're set up in such a way that you can focus as much of the light as possible onto the comet that you're trying to push away. So the difficulty with having a laser on the ground is that you have the atmosphere, and the atmosphere distorts your laser beam and spreads out the beam a lot. And so, if you have a laser on the ground, you'll need some sort of adaptive optics technology to ensure that basically just adjusting your beam in such a way to counter the effects of the comet or the atmosphere, so that by the time it reaches the comet, it's still very narrow and focused. And so, constraints of the system, type of system, and beam divergence is the main constraint. In fact, it's just, divert, it's just diffraction. Uh, I mean, with a typical laser that you see on the Earth, the beam remains fairly narrow for the entire length that you see. Uh, but once you extend that beam out to astronomical distances of several AU, the beam can actually spread pretty wide. In fact, it's limited by uh, the wavelength divided by the size of the laser array that you have set up, roughly. And you want a small beam divergence so that as much of your laser beam is focused onto the comet as possible. Otherwise, you're just wasting the energy that doesn't hit the comet. And so, if you also, you're limited by power because with high power, you can actually vaporize the ice on the surface of the comet. If you don't have high power, you're basically like shining a flashlight at the comet, right? So I mean, if you can try shining a flashlight on a block of ice, it's not going to do anything. And so the power, the average power at least, is constrained for space lasers by the size of your uh, photovoltaic array, your solar panels. And, uh, but you can increase the actual power of the laser by, in addition to having additional laser elements, you can essentially superpower it by having, adding a battery system to supplement your uh, solar power so that you can get a higher operating power. 
So for example, you might have a laser operating at one gigawatt, even if the solar panels are only providing one megawatt of power, if you only turn it on for, say, one second for every 1,000 seconds. So with ground lasers, those are constrained in addition to beam divergence, also by the local electricity grid, the weather. I mean, if it's cloudy, your laser is probably not getting through all the clouds. And also where the comet is in the sky, because if the comet is actually in the other hemisphere, for example, you have a little laser in Antarctica, but the comet's approaching from the direction of the North Pole, you can't shoot your laser underground. So you're limited by those constraints. So the big question is, is such a system going to work? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> uh, the exact answer will depend on a very large number of parameters from the type of laser you have, from the, uh, the power, the efficiency of the electricity going, going into the laser, uh, how long you have before it impacts. It makes a big difference if it impacts, say, one month after you find it versus five years after you discover it and also how much it responds to you. But let's just consider a few typical uh, parameters for uh, these variables. And for some typical parameters, uh, you might consider a 500 meter comet. I showed you comet sighting spring before, the one that passed by Mars. That was a 500 meter comet. And you'll need a laser of on the order of about 500 meters and powered at five gigawatts. Or if you have a uh, one or five kilometer comet, this is the kind that killed the dinosaurs, you'll need about a two kilometer laser array or yeah, operating at 100 gigawatts. And so typical in this case means uh, reasonable. I mean, obviously we don't have a typical uh, two kilometer laser because we haven't built that yet. So I basically just adjusted these parameters in such a way that they're consistent with current technology and maybe a s projected increased improvements in current technology into the future. Um, so there are a few other considerations to deflecting a comet. So you might consider fragmentation. Like I showed you, Comet Ison, which passed by the sun, it fragmented into a big dust cloud. Now, some comets, they don't just fragment into a big dust cloud. They fragment into like two or three big pieces. And in that case, you'll just now have to deflect a large number of comets. And if you have n fragments, you now essentially have to have like n different lasers targeting those n comets. And that's can be a big pain if and gets really big. So you don't want your comet to break apart when you're deflecting it. And so that's actually part of the current work is to see how we can deflect a comet without breaking it into a, a large number of pieces. You might consider like lowering the laser power, for example, so that you don't vaporize it at that high of a, high of a rate. So you also have to consider dust because when the comet, when you vaporize the comet, it takes out a bunch of dust from the nucleus, and you end up with a big dust cloud, which seems harmless, and in fact is harmless dust on the ground, but that for satellites in space, like GPS satellites, I mean, a large cloud of dust can take those out, and uh, then we'd be left without our uh, infrastructure in space. slide showing. But uh, so that's actually about it for my presentation. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, you said one of the biggest issues with um, making lasers the atmosphere from the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, have you guys considered like placing a laser like on a different astral body, such as like the moon, where it has a 
Uh, yeah, that is one possibility. We're currently considering more just having it near low Earth orbit because that's e it's easier to take something from the ground to low Earth orbit than it is to take it all the way to the moon. So it's cheaper to actually just put something in orbit. I guess we'd have to have multiple, right? Because, as you say, it could be northern hemisphere or southern. Yeah. If you have one, if you, if you use like ground-based lasers, you'll have, probably have to have multiple if you want to deflect against, defend against all the comets. Uh, how acceleration due to this jetting compares to acceleration due to solar gravity? Uh, much smaller on the order of probably around five orders of magnitude less, three to five orders of magnitude less. Although I think it's been hypothesized by some people that some of those comets, like uh, these, two. so comet I sign over here. This is of a group of comets called sun grazing comets because they pass really close to the sun, so they experience really high uh, radiation from the sun, and so they rise really quickly. A uh, few people have hypothesized that the acceleration from for some comets of this group, not for this comet, but for some comets in this group, are actually comparable to the solar gravity. Although I'm not, I don't think that's actually broadly accepted by the scientific community yet. Costly, no matter what decision we make. Yes. It's uh, basically like moving a big mountain that's in space. Any more questions? Thank you so much.